that today we are taking up the both the legacy and the higher ed bill. And I have with me here today the chair of the higher ed committee, Representative Nornis, the chair and the vice chair of the legacy committee, Representative Gunther and Representative Lehman. And with that, I will turn it over. Who wants to talk first? Um, All right. Uh, great people come in last. Uh, legacy committee is is put forth about ten years ago. 2008, and uh, it collects three-eighths of 1% of the sales tax, so our, our target isn't figured, figured out by the legislature, it's figured out by the consumers. Whatever they spend, we get three-eighths of 1% of the sales tax from those things, and from that, we take care of uh, heritage, uh, habitat for deer hunters, and pheasant hunters, and duck hunters, and timber, and... Uh, we spend money on land, and uh, the DNR likes to make money by providing public hunting land, and they uh, claim to gain $2 billion from the revenues that we produce. And then there's the clean water part, which I think the vast majority of people voted for, our, for the legacy bill because of clean waters. It's certainly something that everybody in Minnesota seems to endear themselves to we are the state of the most fresh waters there is. In fact, there's 3.4 gazillion gallons of fresh water in Lake Superior, in case you wanted to know that. And then we have the Arts and Historical Society. We fund many, pro many projects for them. We fund the State Arts Board. We fund the Arts Councils throughout the state. We fund uh, $27 million for the State Historic Society, and uh, we do many good things with that. And then we have the parks, state parks. We have Met Council parks and rural parks. And they're funded at 40, 40, 20, 20 going to rural parks. But that's not really the full story because many of the state parks are in rural Minnesota. And with that, I'd certainly like to ask, answer any questions or try to that you might have about the Legacy Committee. Why don't we go on to higher ed first and then we'll okay. questions. All right. Hello. Um, I'm Bud Nordis, Chair of the Higher Education Committee, and uh, I guess happy today that we're going to be uh, offering our omnibus bill on the floor of the House. Uh, the bill is, is uh, primarily all about students. Uh, responsibility of the committee is to fund uh, both the Minnesota State System the University of Minnesota, and also the state grant program. Those are the three main functions of the committee. Uh, we're focusing this year on career readiness, uh, student debt, and, uh, and accessibility. So we've got kind of a theme that we're trying to, uh, to keep uh, as our focus. Uh, $150 million is the amount of money that's, in the, uh, uh, that's our target for this year. And from that, we divide it up among those three uh, targets that I, or uh, areas that I mentioned before. Um, I think we've got a, a, a good bill. We've got some loan forgiveness programs for uh, students. We've got uh, uh, various initiatives in this bill that, again, uh, help students. Um, and there are some new programs. There's one that, uh, uh, as far as uh, helping students, we've got a provision in there that that uh, targets uh, students who want to be teachers, teachers of color. Uh, there's a tremendous need for teachers all across the state, and that specific area uh, is targeted uh, in this bill to help, uh, again, find those students that would become teachers and in our public school system. Um, probably that's as much as you need to know at this time, and I'll uh, answer questions too if you have any. Yes, Mr. Chairman, would you yes. would you compare uh, what you have in the bill for U of M and Minsky versus the governor's request? So, in terms of increase number base, um, off the top of my head, I know we're under what the governor wanted. Um, of the 150, uh, there's 22 million that goes to the university. Um, 77 goes to Minnesota State, but actually, it's about 94 million. But uh, there are some programs, or within that, there's things that we fund 
uh, that are responsibilities. So as far as student, as far as money going to help students and keeping tuition down and keep the operation, that would be about 77 million. 34 million is for the state grant program. And the state grant program. And that also allows for the, uh, the family share to be reduced by 10%, another area that we're helping the cost of higher education. Tuition freeze is part of our plan for the Minnesota state system. Uh, we would encourage the university to be as, as uh, dedicated as they could be to doing something similar, uh, but we can't control what they do. But Minnesota State, we have a freeze for two-year schools with a one-year drop of 1%, in, that'd be in the second year. Uh, the four-year schools would have a tuition increase possible. Uh, I don't have a number there because it hasn't been determined with a freeze the second year. So it's, again, it's not anywhere close to what the, what the, what the governor is asking for. Uh, but um, again, with our target, I think we've, we've done pretty well. Can you explain how you can't control what the university does, but you can do this with the Minnesota with the state system? Well, the university is a land grant institution, and uh, they kind of operate on their own. Uh, we do fund them, but we're only a small part of their budget, and and so we have limited uh, ability to influence them. The, probably the main reason or the main thing that we do is we, uh, as you probably know. Uh, we help to select the Board of Regents to then run the university. So our main, if you want to say, control of the university is by selecting the Board of Regents that probably would carry through with, with, with some of the wishes that we might have. Uh, Minnesota State is the system that the state operates, that's ours, and so we're responsible for that and, uh, and uh, nobody else. The university system often asks for enough money from the state with the goal of being able to keep tuition flat uh, or reduce the increases. Do you give them enough money to give them that leeway to, to freeze tuition? In the years that I've been chair of higher education, I don't think there's been a year when there's been a freeze at the university. We have talked about it. We have funded as much as we possibly could, but uh, they, they, uh, uh, they've never had a freeze. Uh, and we're not talking freeze uh, this time around either, I believe. Can I just address that too? Yeah. I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, but yeah. I believe that the university has said that that if even if we were to meet their full request, they still would not reduce tuition. That is that is correct. So they've talked about a two percent, uh, but again, it depends on. Um, that's before they saw the twenty-two million, I think. So they, they could be looking at maybe something a little more than that. But at the same time, the university has just announced a new scholarship program. So we give them credit for, for helping uh, with the student uh, debt or, or high cost of tuition. We have a $5,000 tuition scholarship that's going to outstate Minnesota students with a limit, I think, of about 100 applicants, uh, which is just starting now, I believe, for this next year. So they're doing their own thing to help. Um, and, and so we'll just keep encouraging as much as we can. Did you say that the four-year Minsky schools could raise tuition at some level this year, but next year they would be frozen? The first year they'd be able to raise, the second year would be frozen at that level. Why did you do it in that order? Does it happen that it's an election year next year? And that we did that two years ago, too. It allows them to make an adjustment. They're, they're all struggling with, I guess, with enrollments, overhead, basically just trying to keep things really uh, humming. And so we allow them that first adjustment which carries over then for the second year as well. And uh, so it's just uh, something we do to try to help them. Um, so it's, it, it worked two years ago in that, uh, so this, we're gonna do it again. So essentially they'll be getting more of their money because they will be able to raise tuition this year and that amount will be carried into the next. That's correct. Okay. Would you mind, Mr. Chairman, just re repeating again, what, what is the arrangement for the two-year institutions? I'm sorry, I didn't. As far as what, tuition? Uh, as far as for tuition, right. Okay. Uh, it's frozen the first year. And the second year, there's a 1% 1 drop. 1% drop. Yes. Again, it's similar to what we did two years ago. And again, we'll need to hear back from the, from the system to see what all that looks like. But that's really what our wish list looks like at this time. 
Mr. Chair, to, to clarify, that's what you were just referring to was your two-year campuses? That's correct. Not Mankato, not Bemidji, the, the two-year campus. Chairman Gunther, is there are there a marquee project or two you can point to in your bill that? Well, one comes to mind from the arts. Uh, Van Patch, Van Patch, uh, Minnesota's greatest athlete, some people say, uh, had a record in trotting horses for 56 years. They want to build a one and a half times lifestyle size bronze statue and put it in the state fairground. That's something that was different. Uh, we fund a lot of uh, arts projects. Uh, there's uh, certainly uh, water is, is a very important thing. We put $22 million in for buffers and giving that to the local soil and water conservation districts so they can manage the buffer bill and manage uh, telling people what they have to do with the buffers that they've had, and the buffer bill has been the same basic law for the last 40 years. But we're now enforcing it, and in order to enforce it, we have to pay the local soil and water conservation districts more money so they have the capacity to do that. Just, just one Dan Patch statue? I know that there was some moves. There's another one that's going to go in Savage in the City Hall, I believe. And both of them are funded through this bill, or the yeah. ma local match is required? Well, there's a local match required. What's the amount from your bill? Uh, my bill is 750000 For the two statues? Yeah, but that's the state's share. How much of the, this bill is wetlands related? Wetlands re related $110 million this year, and more than that next year. And does that in any way dovetail with the governor's buffer plan, or is it kind of its own deal? It has a little bit to do with it. We did give some money for CREP and RIM projects and riparian buffers and stuff like that. There's money in there all over in my bill as well as the environment's bill. And CREP is the federal? That's the federal, federal pro project that the federal government gave us $350 million with the CREP funding but we have to match part of that. So in order to access that money, I think it's 2.7 to 1, we have to contribute some of our own money. And I think the governor's goal is to get 90-some million dollars that uh, some of it comes through the bonding bill and other places. And there's some type of follow-up on it to see that the wetlands money is being is effective. Is that correct? That's correct. We try to always make sure what money we spend is being spent right. Thank you. Leader Pepin, on a different topic, you, you kind of rose pretty quickly yesterday to speak out about the card game comment. Uh, is, is there anything further that will be done on that, uh, any kind of complaint lodge or anything of that nature? Well, I think we'll likely um, file a protest and dissent letter, obviously pointing out race and gender on the House floor. Picking out one group of people against another is not appropriate, and we weren't appreciative of what she'd said, and we feel like that... Our job as leaders in Minnesota is to bring people together and not divide people. And so this kind of identity politics isn't helpful for us to work together and get things done. So disappointed that she has chosen not to uh, apologize to the legislature and to, uh, as well as those she's offended at home, but we will be filing a, a letter. What's the practical effect of a letter like that? Nothing. We just we put it in the journal and it makes a statement. Um, you know. Several of our members will likely sign it, and it just makes a statement that, you know, we don't view this as appropriate uh, language for leaders of the state of Minnesota, and we'll also be reminding people uh, of our ethics policy, and we'll be putting our um, ethics uh, code of conduct on every member's chair today as well to remind them of that, you know, we're expected to be held to a higher standard, and that uh, we expect members to work together and represent the state of Minnesota as a whole. Madam Leader, she was upset about people playing cards in the retiring room. Is that a proper activity? Is that something that is sanctioned uh, during the session? You know, I think that what she didn't mention is there are members of both parties right. in the back, and there were men and women in the back. And a retiring room is something that that's where members go to eat, and, um, you know, we're there several times. We're there for long hours, and um, 
that's always sort of been an off-limits area. People need to um, go back there to take phone calls and things like that so that you're not talking on the house floor. And I, I mean, this is something that's always been done there. And to point out one group of people and to make it seem as though it's one specific race and one specific gender that was, and, and kind of imply that it was one specific party in the back is, um, it's just not something that we've talked about on the floor before. And I think that people know that when you're on the house floor for many, many hours on end, people are gonna need to take a little break to, to eat, get a drink of water, take a phone call, and in some cases, you know, rest a little bit. We have members of different ages. Um, and it's been kind of off limits in the past. People know that that's where you go and when you um, can't be quiet on the floor, you're, you frequently hear the Speaker of the House saying, members, please take your discussions elsewhere. Well, one of the elsewhere is, is the retiring room. You view it more as a relaxation area during a session and playing cards would be appropriate. I would view it as a place where people do whatever they do that doesn't involve the House floor. So people need to eat, people need to go back there to get coffee, to get water, um, to take phone calls, to have legislative conversations that uh, that you shouldn't be having on the floor because you're supposed to be the speaker, supposed to be speaking on the floor. So when people need to talk with other legislators, that happens frequently. Uh, that's where we do some of our deal making. We meet, we have the opportunity, everybody's there. We have legislators of both sides, so people talk in the retiring room. So it's a multi-purpose room that's, that's used and that's something that, um, you know, reporters aren't allowed there. Members of the Senate aren't allowed there. Um, so that's, it's just really, you know, if people have guests, they're allowed back there. So it's a kind of a multi-purpose room. And um, again, just disappointed that the tone that was taken was not a tone of cooperation. It wasn't a tone of we need to work together to get things done. It was just sort of pitting one group of people and accusing them of not listening to another group of people. And I think that if you listen to the, the floor session, um, is, the, is it generally a problem that people don't always sit and pay attention to speeches? Well, yes, I think that that happens and that's why the speaker frequently has to quiet the, the chamber, but um, to accuse one group of, of people uh, for their race and gender to say that they weren't listening because of another uh, person's or group of person's race and gender doesn't really uh, get us to where we need to be to be able to come to compromise and work together as a state. Following up on Pat's question, were they actually playing cards back there, or was this just an expression that you used about people sitting around having a, a card game? I don't know what they were actually doing back there because I was on the floor. Um, I'm not sure what they were doing back there. And there's also several offices back there as well that, that people you know, sometimes go into and use and make phone calls and things like that. So I don't know exactly what was going on because I, of course, was on the floor paying attention, attention to everything everyone was saying. Can they hear the debate in there? Is there, there is, there's, speakers there's, uh, and uh, is there a there is, there's, the Yep, show? there's, there's um, at least two TVs just in the main retiring room as well as the audio is on in all of the staff offices, which members frequently use to have these, you know, kind of meetings. Sometimes legislators will go into one of the back offices and, um, you know, meet about their bills or, you know, try to talk to other legislators about their bills as well. But it's um, full access. It, um, in the both the retiring room and in the back offices for being able to hear the session. Sometimes it's even better. We can even hear it in the restrooms. Uh, it's easier to hear actually than even on the floor. So, yeah, Madam, Madam Leader, Madam Leader. Have, have you, you you touched on this a little bit? But have you ever known a speech on the floor to change anybody's mind? I mean, is that just an <laughs> exercise for the people at home? Can you ever remember changing? I think the that I I think I've made speeches that have changed. Well, maybe not, but. Um, <laughs> You know, I don't know. I mean, I think that the point of speaking is you're representing your constituents and your beliefs. And I know I can't say whether people people's minds have been changed. I, we like to think that they do. We like to think that when we talk, we influence people and, and change minds. But the fact of the matter is it's very difficult when you've been on the floor for many, many hours to not have to run to the bathroom or not have to go somewhere else. To, and so um, the idea that people are sitting in their seats paying attention to every single second of every single speech is, is just very difficult to fulfill in, in real life. Madam Leader, um, aside from the issues of protocol and diplomacy, the assertion is that white guys are not paying attention to this, to this debate over, over protest, uh, perhaps as much as female lawmakers. Do, do you disagree with that assertion? I don't think that's true. I think that there were members of both parties and both genders um, back in the retiring room and, and listening to the debate. The debate had gone on for quite a while. I don't know if, um, you know, part of it is that 
at some point that there's not a lot of new issues, it's just new stories about how um, a certain thing impacts them. And so um, I, don't, I don't think that's true. I think that both sides are guilty of not always paying attention 100%. Both sides are guilty of using the retiring room. Both sides are guilty of going to the bathroom and eating lunch. Um, <laughs> so I, I don't really th think that that's true. And I don't think it's right to accuse one group of people to, that they're not listening because of um, you know, the gender or the race of another group. That's just not, we shouldn't be paying, playing identity politics in the legislature. We should be working together and uh, doing what's right for the state of Minnesota. I do need to get the authors up to the floor for sessions. So. Yes, Sorry. thank you. <laughs>